Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. So today we're going to be talking about asymptotic notations. Uh, so last day I had given you some definitions for a variety of different kinds. You may have seen big O previously. I gave the formal definition for that. We talked about big omega. And we also talked about big theta and a couple others. I wanted to do some examples today and talk about some properties that different asymptotic notations have. So as we do some examples, I'll remind you of these definitions as we apply them, just to make sure everybody's on the same footing. So I thought I would start off with an example proving using the definition of big O, I'm gonna try proving that five N squared plus N is big O of N squared. Now, just as a reminder, remember, the game plan with big O notation is as follows. This is just at least a, a way I like to think about it. So take a step back and take a look at what you're trying to establish. So it says that there exist these two constants, C and N zero, where C is a positive real constant. So it's a positive real number. And N zero is a positive integer. That means it starts at one, two, three, four. It's not zero, not zero. Such that we have this inequality that's going to hold, and it has this inequality has to be true for all values of n that are greater than or equal to n zero. So your game plan is to find these two constants. Those that's your main game plan here is find these two constants so that you can make this inequality work for all n greater or equal to n zero. So the gig game plan is I'm going to find those two constants. That's what most of our proofs are going to look like. Does everybody understand the game plan? Is you're gonna see I'm gonna find those two constants and I'm gonna to have to justify them to you. That those two constants in fact work. So you'll find a very common strategy for doing this is that you identify one of the constants, then you establish that the other constant works. You'll very often find me picking C first, then N zero, but it really doesn't matter uh, which approach you'd like to take. It matters how you argue. So I'm hoping I'm gonna give you today some, some ways of approaching these things. So first, if everybody's okay with the game plan so far, give me two thumbs up. Okay, so I'm gonna be showing you some fun recipes for dealing with this kind of stuff. So we're gonna see how we apply the definitions and I'm gonna give you a couple of tricks for how to deal with these. So the first one is I'm gonna establish this right here. Now, remember, I usually, it's usually it's a good idea to lay out the game plan, like what I'm going to do. Because there's several ways I could maybe prove this statement. We're gonna use the definition of big O, so I'm gonna tell you what I'm going to do. And once I've done that, I just have to invoke the definition of big O and say, hey, look, I gave you your two constants, we're done. So all I'm gonna say is we need We need to find constants. C, remember C is a positive real number. And N zero, which is a positive integer. Such that, such that, that T sort of getting really close to the edge of that board. Such that, for n greater or equal to n zero, five n squared plus n is less than or equal to c times n squared. So notice all I'm doing is I'm plugging in c, sorry, so plugging in f and g, and you'll notice I'm just saying what I'm going to do, right? So remember, the game plan is to find these two constants. If I can do that, such that it satisfies this inequality for all of these, as I say right there, what does that mean? It means F is big O of G, or in our case, five N squared plus N is big O of N squared. So all I have to do is just use, find these two constants, justify them to you, and then I just invoke the definition of big O. That's the end goal for us here. So you might ask Dan, you said about picking the constants and then trying to justify the other one. So how exactly do you do that? Now, 
for every different case, you're gonna run into different circumstances and it, it takes and boils down to intuition a lot of the time. But I can tell you that there exists some techniques that are very easy to point out to you once you see it. So here's an idea I'm going to suggest. It's just a suggestion. Is notice that I have a five N squared here and I have an N here. And notice that my inequality has five N squared here and I have an N right here. Like that's just from what I've stated here. What I would like to do is make this right hand side big enough that it will be at least whatever's on the left hand side. So I'm going to try to make it look like what's on the left hand side. And because what I have here is a quadratic term, but notice it's a quadratic here and a linear term. What if I made them all quadratic terms on the right hand side? but make it look like 5n squared plus n. So I'll just make those terms out of quadratic terms. So instead of it all well, like this n being here, I'll try to make it look like an n squared, try to make it look like what I'm trying to establish. So you might ask Dan, so what do you do? So now keep in mind, because of the way this definition works, there can be many, many pairs of constants. There can be many c's and n zeros that work. I'm just showing you a very simple pair of constants that you can pick that make it real easy to argue without needing to pull out a lot of analysis. That's what I'm trying to do for you. So I'm trying to show you how you can do this a little quicker. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick, because I would like to make it so it's something like 5n squared plus n on the right hand side, but notice I have an n squared term here. I would like to make it so it's like 5n squared plus something that looks like an n, but it's n squared instead. So does anybody have any ideas of how, what, how big I need to make this constant? What should I, any good guesses? I see a six, that's a wonderful guess. That's a wonderful guess. Now that's the one I was actually gonna be going for. So I'm gonna pick c is equal to six. So I've picked one of the constants. My job is to just simply justify an n0 to you. And then once I'm done that, I'm done. I just have to conclude by invoking the definition. So I'm just going to say what I'm going to do. Then, then we need, we need to find, we need to find n0 such that for that F looks like it kind of melted in the microwave, kind of like smeared on there. For all n greater or equal to n zero, five n squared plus six, sorry, not six, plus n, I'm getting ahead of myself. Five n squared plus n is less than or equal to six times n squared. Now, you might ask, okay, so how can I justify this? Now, for somebody that no, has some familiarity with polynomials, this might look like something, oh yeah, well, that seems that means straightforward. It's very clear what that, that this should hold for all n that are greater or equal to one, right? If you stared at this, you'd be like, yeah, that seems okay. But I need some way to justify this for you in a very simple way. And I'm gonna show you an approach that I think makes this very easy to do. So, like I said, I'm gonna to try to write out whatever's on the right-hand side of this inequality, but I'm gonna make it look like what's on the left-hand side. So notice that, notice that 5n squared plus n is less than or equal to 5n squared plus n squared, which this is of course equal to 6n squared for all n greater or equal to one as, now watch, now I'm going to explain how we're going to do this. Now, you may or may not have seen this before, but I wanna make sure I explain how I'm going about this. So some tips I'll point out is notice that every time I make a statement, I'm trying to make a statement about the domain of the statement, and I'm also telling you what I'm trying to establish. So notice there's no blind inequalities here. I, I say what I'm going to do, and everything falls from one point to the next, to the next, to the next. Now, here's the strategy I'm going to use. Now, this is an inequality here, right? Now, if I look at 5n squared and 5n squared, you'd tell me that these two are in fact equal to each other, right? 
In fact, it, it's true that there should be less than or equal because it's equal. Then you would agree with me probably that uh, n is less than or equal to n squared for all n greater or equal to 1, right? Why? Because if you were to take just n and n squared on each side of the inequality, you divide by n on both sides, you'll end up with n is greater or equal to 1, right? So I want to show you just an analogy using buckets. So, so notice I have three buckets here. I have three buckets. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have... So notice that I have in my first grouping here, I have five and a five. So I'm going to put five of these into my my left hand side. So this is what's going to represent 5n squared. Now, if I match that with another 5, so I have 4, 5, you'd agree with me that the number of, of, of bottles I have in my left bin is at least whatever in my right bin, right? So, now this is where things get a little fun. Okay, so now you'd agree, so does that make sense everybody? So, I'm just grouping them by their similarity. Now, if I told you that this bottle means n, I'm going to put that in the left one. Now, if I were to introduce another n squared term, and I put it into the right one, you would agree with me that everything in the left bin is at least as much as in the right bin, right? Regardless of if there are n's or n squareds. That's exactly what we're going to do. So notice that this inequality is going to hold because this 5n squared is less than or equal to this 5n squared for all n greater or equal to 1. And this n is less than or equal to the n squared for all n greater or equal to 1. So if I sum over both inequalities I just described to you verbally, then that should be true for both when I add over them like this. Just like when I put them together in these two buckets. Does everybody see that? So that's what I'm going to do. So now this is me just saying something and I'm going to justify it now for you. So you can sum over these inequalities in bits and pieces, then put them out together. So let me see here, as 5n squared is less than or equal to 5n squared for all n greater or equal to 1, and as I'm taking the bins with me, and n is less than or equal to n squared for all n greater or equal to 1. So notice that all you do, so these are my justifications for this inequality to work, because notice that if I take this inequality and I add it to this inequality, you end up with what's sitting right here. Does everybody see that? So if you have several of these terms, like one, two, three, all the way, like say you have several of these, you could sum over all of those inequalities. In fact, if you find it a little bit hard for yourself to remember that, just say as by summing over all the above all the following inequalities. This is less than or equal to that for all these. This is less than or equal to this for all of those, and so on. Does everybody understand what I just did here? Am I crystal clear? So notice that if I add this inequality, the left-hand side of this one, just like I add to my bucket, and I add this to my bucket on the left side, I end up with this. I add this to my right bucket and this to my right bucket, I end up with that. Keeps things really nice and simple, right? You don't have to pull out like root solving or anything like that. It keeps things very simple. And that's wonderful because if we could find ways to argue things without having to pull a lot more machinery, it saves us time, right? And we like to save time for us, right? <laughs> At least this is one way you could approach it. So can somebody tell me what should I pick for N0 then? Now I must stress, there's many n zeros that can work, but tell me the smallest one you can think of. Yes, one. So now look, look everywhere where I make a statement, notice that all of these for 
are true for all n greater or equal to 1. So that's how I'm picking out n0. Does everybody see that? So notice that I say this is true for all n greater or equal to 1. n is greater or equal to 1 and n is greater or equal to 1. So that's what tells me what I should pick. If I end up with a bigger number, say right here, like if this was a 2 or a 3, I pick the larger of the values. You want to pick the one that is the largest value so that the, everything works. So, choose n0 is equal to 1. Therefore, therefore, by selecting, by selecting such a c and n0, as I'm taking the buckets with me, it follows, it follows from the definition, from the definition of big O, that 5n squared plus n is big O of n squared. And that's the end of the proof. So are there any questions about this example? Anything at all? So notice that the trick I used here the trick I used here is I tried to make this look like what's sitting inside of here. So I wrote what I had over here in terms of what this would look like if I were to have as many terms to match what's ever on the left side. So if you're doing big omega, you would do the opposite of this. Um, we'll see an example of me doing this when we get to big omega. But believe it or not, what I've described to you is actually a recipe for dealing with any polynomial. Now, some people show you this, some don't. I like showing it to my students because I don't want to waste your time. So let me head on over here. I'm going to show you a general recipe you can use for any big O claim involving polynomials. And you'll be saying, Dan, that's pretty neat. Because what I did here with my buckets, where I had the left bucket and the right bucket, you can actually generalize this over any polynomial with integer coefficients, sorry, not, yeah, well, you need real coefficients or you have integer powers on your polynomial. So here's a general recipe I'm going to give you here. So here's a simple way you can prove big O claims with polynomials. So if, imagine if I give you a polynomial where there's coefficients, these are the numbers that are sitting out in front of these terms. So these could be any real numbers. So I must stress this technique is very general. I put the proof for this in the notes if you find yourself curious about it. Uh, so you can have a polynomial P of, uh, sorry, with P that is equal to A0 times N to the K plus A1 times N to the K minus one plus all the way down to A to the K, sorry, AK minus one times N plus AK. In that case, you would have N to the power of zero, which is just one. So all of these coefficients, all of them are just real numbers. So they could be zero, they could be negative, they could be positive. So you might ask, okay, so if I give you one of these, what can you say? Well, you could say that P is big O of N to the K. And you might ask, Dan, how do I do that? Well, do you remember what I did over here? Well, I looked at all my terms and I tried to make them look like all of the other terms on the left-hand side. But some of those might be smaller than the most dominant term I have, which happens to be inside my big O. So all you do is you take this bucketing idea I had here and you just expand upon it. And so the exact same idea I gave you with this bucket approach, that's actually how the proof actually works for this. So if you understood how, what I did with these buckets, you could understand that proof. It just has more symbols in it. So here's the idea in the proof, is all you do is you look at all those coefficients there, and you just take the absolute value of them. You just add them up, 
and that's C, and N0 will always be one. So this gives you a general recipe for dealing with polynomials that look like this. So just as an example of this, suppose I gave you a polynomial, that, that looks way more complicated than my first example. I have four n to the power of four plus three n cubed plus two n squared plus n. Looks rather complicated. If you try to tackle this algebraically, you could, but it's a lot of work. Um, but it's dead instead. If you just keep this in mind, you can establish that this polynomial is big O of n to the four. Now, I must stress that if there's ever terms that are missing in the polynomial, what coefficient do they have in front of that term? What coefficient would it have? So for example, if I had it where, say if it was that it was four n to the four plus two n squared plus n, what would be the coefficient in front of the cubic term there? It would be zero, exactly, exactly. So notice that you can use this by just plugging in the coefficients as you see them. So this is a really simple approach for dealing with this. So in my example I have here, all I do is I take four plus three plus two plus one, that's 10, and I would pick n zero to be one. I left out the justifications behind this, but believe it or not, the justification is exactly the same idea I gave over there. The difference is that we're gonna have four inequalities that I write over on this left-hand side instead of just two, because I have four terms, right? I have, well, sorry, one, two, yeah, I have four terms over here. So I would say, as four n to the four is less than or equal to four n to the four, for all n or equal to one, and so on down all my successive powers like this. You'll see in the example in the notes. So I put all the details in the notes if you wanna take a look at this. But you'll see that this strategy is very general and easy for tackling big O claims. So usually when you run into polynomials, usually this trick will work for you. So are there any questions about that? So just, if you find yourself dealing with a polynomial like this, you can just sum up the coefficients that are sitting in front of them like this, and that gives you a very easy recipe for proving big O claims involving polynomials. So any questions? Ah, uh, what if one of the coefficients is negative? This is the great part. This works regardless. <laughs> so notice that if, if any one of the coefficients, so say if this was say minus 10 right here, if this was like minus 10, like that's one, 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 all these are one and this is a minus 10. Notice that the suggestion I'm giving you is that you would make this the absolute value of minus 10, which is just 10. And then when you do the same argument, I did over here with this bucketing idea, you'll end up with minus 10 times n to the, I guess k minus one is less than or equal to, uh, it would be 10 times n to the power of k minus one, which clearly has to hold, right? I don't like using the word clearly. It's usually a, a term, like saying things are obvious or clear is usually not a good strategy when you're proving claims. I think it's evident when you look at it because minus 10 is less than 10. So does that clarify that? So I must stress that as in the form I gave it to you here, this actually isn't true for big O, sorry, with big theta. However, if you make all the coefficients positive, there is a way to make this work, okay? You can use a very similar strategy I just described here. It's just that those negative terms, like the negative coefficients can mess with trying to establish a big omega claim, okay? So are there any other questions about this? So this should, I, I, I'm not even kidding, this will save you a lot of time when you're playing around with these. And it gives you, in fact, if you look at the full proof for this, for this right here, you'll see that my proof I gave over there is actually a special case of it. In fact, if you were to just pick up that proof and then you just pick up one polynomial, you should be able to just plug it in with ease. And you just write it out in that special way. It's, it's really simple. So at first, you can have these really daunting looking polynomials, but believe it or not, with this one technique, you can save yourself a lot of time. Okay, so what I wanna do next is I wanna do an example with big omega, because I wanna pull out each one of these and show you an example with them. So let's head on over here. I'm gonna use a very similar strategy I did last time except I have to now think about this in terms of an asymptotic lower bound, not an upper bound. So the same exact idea won't necessarily work here because now I care about it the other way around. 
So let's uh, let's talk about this. So. So let's talk about big omega. So I want to remind you of the definition of big omega before we proceed. So you understand the game plan. As soon as you understand the game plan, what I'm doing isn't that strange, right? It's all really just me using definitions. So let me just switch around this definition a little bit. So keep in mind, I gave you these definitions last day. This is mostly just as a reminder. So if I'm doing big omega, remember f is big omega g if and only if there exists two constants c and n0 in the same way we had it for big O such that f is greater than or equal to c times g of n for all n greater or equal to n0. So notice all I do is I flip the inequality. It's just the other way around. So Here's the fun part. If you know how to do big O, you can do big omega. It's the same game plan except that inequality change. That's it. That's it. So let's do an example. I'm going to pick something that's a little tougher this time because I think it's important that you don't just see polynomials because I just gave you a recipe for dealing with a lot of claims that you're going to run into very often when you're doing running time analysis. So. A lot of those will fall under this branch. I want to show you something involving logarithms. So let's try proving that log base 2 of n plus 2 is big omega of log base 2 of n squared. So I'm going to prove that log base 2 of n so keep in mind all this log parts by itself, plus two is big omega of log base two of n squared. Now, at first when you look at this, you'll be like, okay, so Dan, that seems a little strange at first. Okay, so there's a quadratic term in the log? Like, this doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, but this is one neat property I want you to be aware of about logarithms. And it comes back really to property of logarithms is that there's a very nice rule you can use with exponents when they're in a logarithm like that. Does anybody remember that rule at all? There's a very nice property that exists when you have an exponent sitting inside of a logarithm term like this, a logarithmic term like, just like this one. Does anybody recall that one? If not, I'm gonna remind you in a bit, but does anybody recall it at all? It's gonna be the key ingredient for establishing this claim. Yes, exactly. You could take this two, you could drop it out in front, just like that. And you're going to see that that's going to be the plain way we're going to approach this. So once you see that exponents and logarithmic terms like this really don't matter, they're just a constant term. It's, well, if, if it is a constant, it doesn't really matter a whole lot. You could just take this out in front, and now you've taken something that looks a lot more daunting that's sitting in here. Because it's looked like at first, if you weren't aware of that property, you look at this and say, oh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why would a quadratic term inside of a logarithm be an asymptotic lower bound on what's over on the left hand side? Like what I have over here. It makes no sense at first until you realize that. So we're going to use that in our example here. So that's going to be kind of the big ingredient we're going to use here. So I'm just going to do the exact same thing I did before, except I just tweaked with that inequality there. So we find constants, we find constants C, which is a positive real number, and N0, which is a positive integer, such that log base 2 of N plus 2 is greater than or equal to C times log base 2 of n squared for all n greater or equal to n zero. So now you might ask Dan, how do you go about picking the constant here if you choose to? Now I must stress that if the terms look a little complicated to play with at first, you can always simplify. So if say if you're looking at this and like, okay, well I don't really know what to do with this. Usually one tip I can give you is try simplifying it first. 
I'm going to do something that's going to be against that advice by selecting a constant, then showing you how if you simplify it, you get the constant spilling out right in the right spot. But I must stress, if you don't like what they were looking at and you're like, okay, well, I know that, that power rule for logarithms, and I know I could pull this out in front, and I could pick a C appropriately, uh, you could do that. You could just say, well, observe that we, by simplifying, say, the left, this inequality, we get blank. Um, but I'm just going to pick a constant, and I'm going to cross my fingers you could follow me, okay? So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick C to be one half. Now, the intuition behind this, of my selection here, is just the one I said, actually was brought up, is that I could bring this two out in front of my logarithmic term here. If I make C one half, then what happens is you'll end up with a two times one half, and those will cancel each other out into a one, and then you'll end up with log base two of n sitting on the right hand side. So that's where we're gonna go with this. So that's why I'm picking one half. So I'm gonna try to make it so that it cancels out my constant by just pulling out that exponent. So let's take a look and see how this will play out. So then we find, this says find, find n zero, so that for all n greater or equal to n zero, log base two of n plus two is greater or equal to one half times log base two of n squared. So now here's where I'm going to invoke that property that we talked about. Observe. So if you ever find yourself just wanting to invoke a property, sometimes using a connective phrase like observe or notice that, there are very often nice ways of transitioning to doing that. That's usually a, a writing tip I can give you. It saves things a little bit. So observe, observe by the power rule, power rule or law, you may call it the power law or power rule, of logarithms that one half times log base two of n squared, n squared is equal to one half times two times log base two of n. And if you simplify this a little further, notice that I have a, two, a half times a two, which is equal to one, right? which is just log base two of n. That's why I pick C as one half. I'm gonna try to make it so that it's as simple as possible on the left, on the right hand side, because notice on the left hand side, I just have log base two of n plus two. So I'll just have an extra two on the, out, on the left hand side. So, so notice that, so notice that, for all n greater or equal to one, log base two of n plus two is greater or equal to log base two of n. So, so what should I pick for n zero then? So notice that, now notice I don't have to really say a whole lot about this, right? I just have an extra two sitting on the left hand side. If you really aren't convinced by this, just subtract log base two of n from both sides of the inequality. You'll end up with two is greater or equal to zero, which I would hope is evidently true for everybody. So what should I pick for n zero, everybody? One, yeah, exactly. So notice that this is true for n greater or equal to one, so choose n zero is equal to one. Therefore, so we're done. So we can say therefore, by the definition, by the definition of big omega, a big omega log base two of n plus two is big omega of log base two of n squared. 
So I'll reiterate what I wrote here. So that's the end of the proof. So therefore, by the definition of big omega, log base two of n plus two is big omega of log base two of n squared. I apologize for it looking a little sloppy there. It's a sloppy Tuesday, I guess. Um, but no, the, the big thing with big omega is trying to identify Identify a constant so that you can make the right hand side just small enough or even match the right left hand side. That's very often what you'd like to do. So you take the idea that I did where I tried to make it look like what's on the left hand side, but as long as it's smaller or equal to the left hand side, we're okay. So it's just the reverse of what I did earlier. So are there any questions about that? And remember, if you ever find yourself looking at one of these and you're like, okay, how exactly could I approach this? Just remember, if you, if you put this over there and you make this into a big O and you switch these two around, you could, you, if you show me that log base two of n squared is big O of log base two of n plus two, that's equivalent to doing this. So if you ever find yourself looking at that big omega and you're like, I don't know, I'm not really cozy with that. You could do that. So, are we okay with this example? Okay, so we're gonna proceed now and we're gonna do an example with big theta because that's gonna be the one that, excellent, excellent. That's what I like hearing. So, if... because I'm trying to make sure it's more that you understand the concepts and you understand kind of some general strategies to play around with these. Because I don't want to leave you just sitting there and be like, oh, I got to do root solving or something. Don't, don't find yourself having to do that. It, it takes time. And when you're dealing with more complicated functions, those strategies tend to get rather complicated. Well, at least more complicated than you need them to be. So I'm showing you some really elementary ways of approaching these things that should feel very natural. So here's the next example I'm gonna do. So I'm going to now, now remember, the definition of big theta is that it satisfies both big O and big omega. As long as you remember that, you know what big theta is. Where big O is an asymptotic upper bound, big omega is an asymptotic lower bound, and big theta is when it's asymptotically an upper bound and a lower bound, meaning it's asymptotically tight. For most purposes that when we play around with algorithm analysis, almost always when you played with big O, say in 210, almost always somebody was talking to you about things in terms of big theta. You just didn't know it because usually the goal was that you came up with the most asymptotically tight result. <laughs> So just to illustrate my point, I may have mentioned this last time, but I just feel like I need to reiterate this, is that if I told you that the running time of binary search, for example, you would tell me that, oh yeah, it takes big O of log n time, right? In the worst case. That's what you would tell me. But mathematically speaking, the mayonnaise, I could also tell you that the running time of binary search is big O of n to the 99. And that's actually mathematically true but it's not very accurate, right? If somebody told you this <laughs> about binary search, you'd be like, uh, did you get enough sleep tonight? <laughs> and they'll look at you and be like, uh-oh. <laughs> um, now, big theta, what it can allow you to do is that if when you formulate your complexity function, it forbids you from being sloppy like this. So when you actually compute the complexity function by deriving, by counting up all those operations, when you actually work out the running time for big for binary search, you could say this, but you most certainly cannot say that. It'll forbid you from doing so because it'll have to satisfy the big omega definition too. So does everybody understand why somebody might use big theta as opposed to big O in certain situations? So sometimes this helps you if you really need to be particular about how tight your bounds are. So this is just more of a tool to enforce that, but most people, when you talk to a lot of computer science people, when you write out big O, they usually mean big theta. They usually do. They usually do that for the sake of audience because more people will know what big O is. That's just a piece of advice. So 
if sometimes people tell you, oh, it's big O of this thing, usually it's big theta, unless it's really just kind of tricky to analyze it. We'll see some examples where it may not be a little clear. Or you may only want to establish one side of the big theta definition. Okay, so let's do an example. So we're going to prove that 3n cubed plus 5 is big theta of n cubed. Now, I must stress that you could use the exact same approaches I had suggested previously in the lecture. You could prove the big O part first or second, and you could prove the big omega part by invoking their definitions and proving those separately. That would imply the big o theta result at the end. You could do that. That's perfectly fine. If you did that on your assignment, that's perfectly fine. In fact, sometimes it's a little easier to do it that way. I'm going to show you for the sake of example how you can do both the big O and big omega parts at the same time. But I must stress you have to be very careful when you do this. So, like I said, you could prove the big O part and the big omega part separately, or you could do it at the same time, but you have to be careful because there's more constants. So, I'll, uh, actually, that's a very good question. I want to address that. So, the question is, if you're discussing worst case time complexity, is it always big O? The answer is actually no. Believe it or not, if I told you this was the binary search running time in the worst case was big theta of log n, that's absolutely fine. I must stress that asymptotic notations are separate from their analyses. So it's a very common misunderstanding that when people talk about best case, average case, and worst case, and I hear this from people that work at quite prominent companies. I had a colleague of mine, for example, that worked at Qualcomm who got, even had this misunderstanding. Um, so some people like, get in their heads, they think like big omega is like best case, they think like average case is big theta and worst case is big O. This is completely wrong. Just to be very clear, remember the process that we go about this. Remember, I have an algorithm, I count up the operations to derive a complexity function. And then what I would like to do is pick the asymptotic notation that best describes what I'm trying to accomplish. So very often you'll run into big O because this is an asymptotic upper bound on the running time. And that will truly capture all of the running times for all possible implementations of your algorithm. But most certainly it also can be easily abused, like in my example here. For example, I could tell you that all of the implementations of binary search, even though they take big theta of log n, so they all belong to that set of functions, they most certainly will belong to big O of n to the 99. Um, the point is, is that it depends on how tight you want to describe your analyses. Is your goal just to tell me how much time is required? Is it necessary that it's tight? Is it necessary that it's at least that amount? Or is it at most that amount? If you mean, it's going to take at most that, then you know it's going to be, if you need it most, big O is your friend. If you need at least, big omega is your friend. If you want to tell me the time complexity in the most tightest terms possible, you can tell me it's big theta. But yes, just to clarify, the analysis of an algorithm and how you classify it in terms of asymptotic notation, they're two separate independent things. Hopefully that clarifies that. It's a really helpful thing. I, I'm hoping that when you walk out of this class, you'll understand that asymptotic notation is a way we can help us describe things. It's, not, it's also a way we help classify or categorize, but it most certainly isn't tied to only one kind of analysis. The analysis is what we decide, and when we want to talk about different problems, you'll see very often that certain notations tend to get attached to them but only in very specific circumstances. So if I want to talk about classically about worst case running times, you need at least big O. That I can clarify for you. But if you want to be tight with your analysis, usually people aim for big theta. But usually they won't write down the big theta. They'll just say it's big O of the thing. But does that, are there any questions about that little uh, side discussion?
So you got to think of these asymptotic notations both like a tool for describing a complexity function, but also as a way we can classify. So if we're talking about classifying problems by their difficulties, classically speaking, it's typically big O. So for example, if you took a class with me in 411, I'll use big O, but that's usually enough to cover what we need. But in this class, sometimes I need to be very specific about my analysis. So sometimes I'll use this one, even when I mean, so if I mean this, often I mean that, but you can't necessarily say the other way around. So just think of it as how tight I want to describe the complexity functions. Okay, so are there any other questions about that? Are we okay with that? I just want to make sure I'm clear. So just think of the asymptotic notation as a mechanism for describing the asymptotic behavior of a complexity function. If we want to talk about the worst case running time, big O most certainly will cover that because it tells you at most how much time is required. But if I want to be tighter with my analysis, like if I want to ensure that I'm talking about the best or tightest description of the complexity, I can use big theta. If I want to say at least how much time I'm requiring, that's when you pull out big omega. You'll see when we start talking about lower bounds, I'll start using big omega quite often. But almost everywhere else, you'll see me using big O and big theta. In fact, many times when I say big, big O, I'll usually mean big theta. It's quite similar to how you may have seen things in 210 even. Okay, so if we're okay with that, let's proceed. So let's do a proof. I'm gonna try proving this claim simultaneously. To prove the claim, to prove the claim, we find constants. Now you're gonna see that I'm going to mash together the definitions of big O and big omega. So you're gonna notice I'm gonna have more constants kicking around. So just be aware of that. That's one thing you have to keep in mind. So I'm gonna have C1, C2, these are both positive real constants. And to make this easier for myself, I'm going to have a single constant that's gonna be my N0, however, if it ever is really unclear what n0 should be, you can always make two constants, and then you can always take the maximum of the two and assign that to be n0. So you would technically in that case have three constants, but let's, uh, let's keep this simple here. Uh, and n0, which is a positive integer, such that, for all n greater or equal to n0, c1 times n cubed is less than or equal to 3n cubed plus 5 is less than or equal to c2 times n cubed. Do you see how I wrote out both of the inequalities simultaneously? So notice that on this side I have what part of the definition? What part of the definition is this? Notice it's saying at least this. That's the omega part, perfect. And then this is our big O part. So notice how I mashed the two definitions together. So what you're gonna see is I'm going to tackle these two parts of the inequalities by picking two constants based on the, some of the ideas we've been using this lecture. And then I'm just going to establish them simultaneously. Like I say, it always depends on what you're given. Sometimes it's a little bit more complicated, so you need to simplify what you're given. For example, on the assignment, you may find yourself playing around with this inequality a little bit and simplifying it before you pick out the constants. In fact, you may actually get the constants by doing that. Um, so, let's do this. Actually, I have a question for you. We've seen how we could deal with polynomials, right? We've seen what we can do. Okay, I have C1 and C2. 
Does anybody have any suggestions of what I should make C1 and C2? So C2, I'll give you a heads up, is the easiest one to pick. Just think back to the first example we did and that trick I did with the polynomials. Yeah, don't, those are the exact two I was thinking of. So I'm going to pick, now keep in mind, you have to make sure it's a positive real constant. Um, it can't be negative. It has to always be positive. Um, so C1, we're going to make that one 3 and the other one 8. So the, ones, the first suggestion we had is actually exactly what I was going to suggest. Now keep in mind, like I say, there can exist many constants. Ah, oh, got you. My apologies. Yes. Met equals. We're okay. <laughs> My apologies. So I'm going to pick this to be 3 and I'm going to pick that one to be 8. Why am I picking this one to be 8? I'm going to use the exact same bucketing strategy I used earlier to make something that looks like this on the right hand side. And you'll agree with me that I have a 3n cubed here plus an extra 5. So I'm just going to pick, I'm going to make this look like 3n cubed and then I know I have an extra 5 over there. Just like my previous example with the logarithms. So here we go. So I'm going to pick constants. C1 is equal to 3 and C2 is equal to 8. Then we find we find n0 so that for all n greater equal to n0. Now I'm just going to plug in those constants. 3n cubed is less than or equal to 3n cubed plus 5 is less than or equal to 8n cubed. So notice how I'm always telling you my game plan. There's no point where I'm just like magically pulling something out of my out of somewhere. <laughs> um, so let's uh, let's proceed, okay? So I'm gonna go to this motherboard over here and finish the justification up here, okay? Okay, once again, go over how you ch got C2 is 8. Okay, wonderful question. Okay, remember back to my first example, how I, I wanted something that looks like what I have right here. So what I would like this to look like is something like this. So I want to be able to have a constant here so that I can expand this out so that it looks like 3n cubed plus 5n cubed. And then what I do is I compare each term, because remember they get added over. So if I have 3n cubed versus the 3n cubed, we know that that's going to be less than or equal to whatever I have if I compare those against each other, piecewise. Then I have this 5. This 5 is less than or equal to the 5n cubed. And notice that if I take those two comparisons, add them, all the ones I have on the left-hand side together and all the ones on the right-hand side together, you end up with what I just described over here. In fact, right here. Yep, no worries, no worries, no. I'd rather be clear than not. Okay, so let's head on over here. Let's finish up this example here. Okay, so let's justify out this first. Now I need you just to kind of visualize in your head that inequality I wrote over there. Just like picture it, imagine it in your head. You have the leftmost size of the inequalities. So you have two inequalities, right? You have this leftmost part and you have the rightmost part. The big omega part and the big, big O part. So I'm going to refer to those both. First, on the leftmost inequality, First, on the leftmost inequality, um, notice that three n cubed is less than or equal to three n cubed plus five. Now, if you're not convinced by that, just subtract three n cubed from both sides of that inequality. You'll end up with zero is less than or equal to five. Uh, for all, now this is the most important part. For all n greater or equal to one. 
second. On the rightmost inequality, on the rightmost inequality, 3n cubed plus 5 is less than or equal to 3n cubed plus 5n cubed, which this is all equal to 8n cubed, if I lump it all back together, um, for all, for all n greater or equal to 1. As, so now I just pull out the exact same set of reasoning I used before, as 3n cubed is less than or equal to 3n cubed for n greater or equal to 1, and 5 is less than or equal to 5n cubed for all n greater or equal to 1. Sorry, I'm going a little crooked here because I'm trying to work around my diversion here. <laughs> So, now I have my two pieces. If you sum over this and that, you end up with this right here. So, I'm going to choose n0 to be 1 this time, just like we did previously. Now, I must stress, not every example you're going to run into is n0 going to be 1. One tip I can give you is that sometimes you'll deal with certain functions where their smallest value may actually end up being a value that is too small. A very common example of this is when you deal with a logarithmic function, and you want to make sure that the logarithmic function itself is uh, equal to at least 1 or 2. So you'll very often find that you'll have to pick n0 to be like 2 or 4. Um, so this will be something you'll run into every once in a blue moon. So always keep in mind the, the behavior of the functions you run into. So, now that I picked all my constants, now I must stress, I picked, I had a C1 and a C2 and an N0. Notice that I will have one of these. If you really wanted to, you can make an N1 and an N2. You can make N1 equal to N2 is equal to 1 if you wanted to. Um, I just kept it to be simple with one constant like this. Therefore, by the definition of big theta, 3n cubed plus 5 is big theta of n cubed. And we're done. Boom. See, that wasn't too bad, right? So are there any questions about this example? Any questions at all? Are we okay with this? Give me two thumbs up if we're okay. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So now I want to talk about proving things are not of a given asymptotic notation. In this course, I'll usually limit that to just generally the definitions of the core ones that we'll be playing around with are big O, big omega, and big theta. The examples I'm going to show you involve big O, and I will never test you on anything beyond that other than a conceptual understanding of them. Just to be very clear. So for example, if I asked you on an exam about, oh, is this not that? You should not need to pull out and prove it for me. I'll expect you just to understand the definition and if it makes sense, based on if it's an asymptotic lower bound, upper bound, or if it's tight. Okay, just to be very clear. Because I know I like to be very transparent with my students about what I expect. Proving not is claimed. So we got to talk about how we would approach this. And that's an M over there, by the way. It looks like it's, it's kind of eating itself. It's turning into an N. Um, so, so remember, we had our definitions, right? We had, oh, our formal definition of big O. We had one for big omega. We had one for big theta. So all you do, if you want to show that they're not that, is you can always just take the definition and you can negate it. Just flip its reasoning. Take the logic of it. Swap it around, uh, negating it. So I'm going to show you how you can do that with big O. Uh, 
So, so a standard way of doing this is by showing that the negation of big O holds. So if I, for example, wanted to know that F is not big O of G, this is true if and only if. Now the game plan changes a little bit. Now, for those that have taken a class, say the second year math class on proof techniques, um, what's the opposite of a universal? Can somebody tell me? So if I say, so if I say for all this one thing, it's an existential, right? It is. So if I give you an existential statement, for example, like our big O definition, where we had to find those couple constants, what am I gonna be ending up with? I'm gonna have, instead of an existential statement, I will have a, what is it? A universal statement, perfect. Now for those that are not acquainted with this, that's okay. I'm gonna lay out exactly how the game plan's gonna work. If and only if, for all C and N zero, there exists. Now remember, remember in our definition we had the for all n greater equal to n zero? Well, you gotta think of it like this. Say somebody posed to you and told you, oh, f is not big O of g. So that means regardless, remember the game we played last time. I pick c and I pick n zero, right? And I justify them for you. Well, what if I wanted to switch it around and say, I, 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 it isn't, it isn't. So that means that the person you're playing this against can't pick a C, can't pick an N0, and there has to be some point. So there's going to be no way you can, so, so you, regardless what C and N0 are, there's going to always be a way I can pick N0 so that it actually creates the opposite outcome for our inequality. So there exists, there exists N greater equal to N0. So that, so that f of n is greater than c times g of n. So just remember, the big idea here is, when I establish that f is big O of g, what I did was I find c and I find n zero and I, and I justify them for you, right? If I wanna show that it isn't the case, you have to show me that regardless of what C and N0 are, so imagine some guy just, some guy or gal or whatever, say your dog or your cat or your bird walked up to you and said, hey, look, here's a C and N0. I think that F is big O of G. You should be able to show me that regardless of what those constants are, there exists an N0 so that the inequality will not work. Does everybody understand the game plan? So now I don't pick C and N zero. They're arbitrary. My job now is to pick N zero and show that that inequality holds, which is just the opposite of the one from our big O definition. So if you think of it like that, it just makes things really simple. So I'm gonna do an example showing you this. So there's a couple of different ways you can approach showing not is claims. I'm gonna show you first, I would argue it depends on how you feel about different techniques for proving claims. This, you can use this directly to prove the claim. Another technique is using contradiction. You may have seen contradiction before. Uh, that's another way you can approach this. So in the context of contradiction, what you would do is you would assume for the sake of a contradiction that F is big O of G, and then you'd write out what the definition is, you tell me what it means, and then you'd simplify it down and see if you get a bunch of nonsense, what we would call a contradictory statement, a statement that is never true. So that is, uh, that is generally how you could, this is another way you can go about it. I'm gonna include an example in the notes of how you can do that. So if you like this direct approach, you can use the direct approach. If you wanna use contradiction, you can use contradiction. I will not be worried about which approach you prefer. So I'm gonna do an example where I use this definition directly. 
So I'm going to show that n squared over 4 is not big O of n. So when you stare at this, remember, big O is an asymptotic upper bound. So if you stare at this and you see a quadratic term right here, you know right away that this is going, this statement here is true. So if you were to change this over to just being is big O of n, you know that that's false, right? So hopefully you will be able to gain that intuition as we play around with concepts in this class. If not, you already have sort of an idea of how that works. So let's do a proof. Now I'm going to give you kind of the setup for this. So remember, the game is different. It's just a little different now. Instead of it being where I have to find C and N zero, I got to imagine that somebody had a big bucket of pairs of C's and N zeros, and they hand them over to me and says, hey, Dan, here's C and N zero. <laughs> Show me how it doesn't work. <laughs> but it has to work regardless of what C and N zero are. So you're going to find when I pick N zero, you're going to see that I'm going to include a C term somewhere in there. Because I don't know what C is, and I don't know, um, I don't, sorry, sorry, I should be more precise. It's not N0. I misspoke, actually, for those that were maybe staring at me and be like, I think there's one thing he's missing, because he said that there's these C's and N zeros. I misspoke, I meant N. We pick N. <laughs> My apologies. Usually I'm very suave with this, but I most certainly meant N. So if you were staring at me and be like, Oh, well, you arbitrarily pick them, so you don't pick them, but then I said that you pick N0. No, you pick N. So we have to find the N that is sufficient to cause that inequality to work that I wrote over there. My apologies, everybody. I was getting into the moment, okay? <laughs> I apologize. So I'm hoping I won't lose anybody about that. So does everybody understand the game plan, though? I'm given C, I'm given an N0. My job is to refute the idea that it is big O. So, and that, I don't know what C and N zero are. So my proof is going to usually mean where I'm gonna pick N, N is going to be involving terms of N zero and C. Because I don't know what they are. I gotta pick N big enough. So you're gonna see me say the following. Let's see N zero be arbitrarily arbitrarily chosen and fixed. So this is the mayonnaise or mustard way of saying, hey, here's my bucket. Here's CNN zero. The, now deal with it. The, the, I, I, I've given you CNN zero. Now, this is the game plan. We need to find n greater equal to n zero, so that n squared over four is greater than c times n. So this is the game plan. We're going to find n. So now you might ask Dan, how do we do that? <laughs> well, it always depends on the problem, but you'll find when you're dealing with things like polynomials. Very commonly, you're going to see where like polynomials or, or generally a lot of the functions you may be familiar with from previous courses, you'll usually do some algebra to simplify down the inequality. And then you'll just look at it and say, hey, look, I have a constant on one side and I have something that actually has no bound on it that usually involves n on the other side. And then usually that's when you're done. You just have to pick n to be big enough so that it's always bigger than the other side. So you're going to see what I mean here in a moment. Notice that that n squared over 4 is greater than c times n if and only if, I'm just going to use this double arrow, if and only if n over 4 is greater than c. So I've divided both sides by n. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply 4 on both sides of this inequality. Implying, implying n is greater than 4c, 
And I can always mention there that by multiplying both sides of the inequality by four. So looking at this, you might say, Dan, well, this n term, is there any cap on how big n can be? Anybody? Is there any cap on how big n can be? Is there any, like, is there something keeping n small or anything like that? No, right? It grows without bound. <laughs> There's nothing stopping it from getting bigger. <laughs> so, but however, notice that, remember, somebody gives you this C. Somebody gives it to you. They hand it over to you and say, hey, Dan, look, here's the C in N0. <laughs> so now my job is to figure out what, what, what is a big enough N to make this work. So, so uh, now this is where I'm going to pick N. You're going to very often find yourself using a max function. Now, if you're not familiar with a max function, it just simply means whatever the arguments of the max function are, you take the larger of the two values for that given value of n. So I'm going to pick n to be the max between the following two values, n0, because I don't know what n0 is. Remember, I don't know what it is. It could be anything, as long as it, somebody hands it over to me. I don't know what it is. So I'm going to take the larger of n0. And remember, if I can make n be bigger than 4c, we're OK, right? As long as n is bigger than 4c. So I'm going to make it big enough. But remember, it's also an integer. So you have to be very careful. So I'm going to use what we're going to call. So you may have seen this before. It's called a ceiling function. So I'm going to use the ceiling of 4 times c to make sure, because remember, c is a real constant. I want to make sure I round it up. So just to be clear for everybody, if I haven't said this before, uh, you may have seen these brackets. They're called, it's called the ceiling. Um, there's another one called the floor. And what it does is it automatically rounds up to the next largest integer. So for example, if I give you four, like 4.4 .4 in here, this would tell me that it's 5. If I put 4.4 .4 in the floor, it gives me 4. You may know the floor function because when in, you do integer division on a lot of programming languages, it, uh, it implicitly is doing the floor because it cuts off any floating point precision. So I'm just using that to make sure I round it up automatically and I make sure it's an integer. And I'm going to add one to it just to make sure it's large enough. And that's all I need. Then we have n greater equal to n zero. So that for this n, the inequality is satisfied. The inequality is satisfied. Therefore, therefore, n squared over 4 is not big O of n. And that's the end. So remember, the game plan here is pick, you pick n, but you need to pick n big enough so that regardless of what c and n0 are, it will cause it so that that inequality that I have in my definition of the negation is satisfied. So are there any last questions about that? So in the notes, I'm going to include another example. In that example, I'll show you how you use contradiction to tackle the approach of uh, proving the negation. It, some people find it a lot easier to do. So I'll let you take a look at that in the notes. And when we come back, we'll talk about properties of asymptotic notations. So up to this point, just to get sure everybody's in the same footing, up to this point, you can do everything on the assignment except for the, I think, the very last problem. Um, so we'll talk more about that for the first half of next class. Okay, everybody? So I'll say thank you very much and have yourself a beautiful day. I'll see you later.